So, Brad, do you remember with the Muppets, uh, Dr. Teeth and the Electric Mayhem? <laughs> oh, my God, I love that. that. That may have been, next to Statler and Waldorf, uh, Dr. Teeth may have been my favorite little uh, part of the Muppet show. Oh, all, all four of them, or five of them, rather, were fantastic. But the thing that I always loved about it is that Henson and Oz were able to somehow be like, hey, you know what's fine for kids? Let's just incorporate drug culture and the Grateful Dead into <laughs> into the Muppets. That's fine. No parents will yeah. mind that. That's fine. It's 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 quite all right. Yeah. Yeah, they were all high as kites. And uh, anyway, I was thinking about them today uh, because my little pupper has been on Valium for medical reasons. Valium. And it's it's like living with a member of Dr. Teeth and the Electric Mayhem. I'm like, hey, buddy. Hey, buddy, you want to go outside and pee? Oh, yeah, man, I do have to pee. I, I'd love to go outside. Yeah. Hey, buddy, hop up, hop up onto the couch, and I'll give you a scritch behind your neck. Okay, let me just get these. Man, you ever looked at your paws? Oh, wow. Look at my paws, brother. They're just amazing. This is awesome. Oh, my paws are so furry. Whoa. He is high as a kite. High as a kite. <laughs> all right, all right. Now, listen, Ollie, it's time to eat. <laughs> oh, man, I could really go. You got a cheeseburger? Come on, help a brother out. I'd love a cheeseburger, I got, man. I I've just... got this I've got this nice bowl of dog food for you. Right over here, it's a bowl of dog food. No problem. Well, just this go is, right this is a legit truth. I, I put the dog bowl in front of him, and he just kind of stared at it for like three minutes. <laughs> Not like made a move, just like head down, like looking at the bowl like, how many bowls are there in front of me? I'm going to go for the center one, I think. I don't know which one to go for. <laughs> this oh. doesn't look like Doritos. It's weird, though, when you're dog looks up at you and goes, you ever tasted a number? <laughs> hey, man, have you ever smelled hope? Oh, wow. Dude, I've got some, listen, time is an illusion, my friend. We're all floating in a cosmic vat of love. Hey, yeah. let's go for a walk, man. I want to meet people and tell them about how great they are. Oh, I'm telling yeah. you, man, as soon as I get done with this bowl of dog food, I'm going to tell you about time. Time is, a con time is a continuum, man. I keep telling you, it's a continuum. I keep you, hey, put your cartooning pen down, man. I want to tell you about how we're all connected by love. We're all connected, man. It's a oneness between us. You don't see it, but my eyes have been opened. And then he's just actively peeing on the floor. My eyes have been open, man. I, oh, what? Is that me? Oh, God, is that me? I'm sorry, brother. Hold oh, on. Whoa. It happens, man. It happens. Hey, listen. I got us some tickets. We're going to go see the Dave Matthews Band. We're going to have a great night. It's going to be fun. I'm Listen, I've been your dog. I'm going to... Just passes out. So That's anyway, fantastic. it's very funny. It's very funny to have a 13-pound dog just high as a kite in the house. Uh, oh, man. Just walking around going, hey, man, we're all love, right? We're all just beings of love and energy. Let's just focus on that. You got to give him a little tie-dye doggy sweater. It'll be perfect. <laughs> a tiny little Volkswagen van again, just so you can drive it around the country. He's like, listen, I'm going to follow the dead around for a few weeks. I, they're gonna, they're playing in Kansas City. I'm going to drive out there. I'll be back, though, man. Everything's cool. Nothing's, there's no bad blood between us. All right. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so on that note, Brad, I'm going to say hello, everybody, and welcome to Comic Lab, the show about not not necessarily about how high my dog is. It's about making comics. And making a living from comics. I'm Brad Geiger, editor of webcomics.com and cartoonist of Evil Inc. And I'm his friend Dave Kellogg, cartoonist of Drive and Sheldon and co-director of Stripped. And this week's hour of comics advice and puppy pot is made possible by your support at patreon.com slash comic lab. So Dave, Dave. Let's talk comics. Let's talk comics, my friend. So I, before we go on, I should let everybody know the puppy's fine. He's he's coming off oh. of the Valium. The condition was just for a little bit of a of a of a dachshund thing that he had with his with his noggin, and uh, he's he's going to be fine. So there's no need to email or worry about him. He's do he's under good veterinary care, and he's doing better. So all is well. Thank goodness for that. I was I was midway through typing my email of concern. <laughs> 
<laughs> I know you were. All right, well, let's jump right into the first question for this week, Brad. So this breast, uh, this question comes in from Sebastian, who writes, hey, are you two sketch pe- sketchbook people? Do you constantly scribble in a notebook or sketchbook anywhere or just while sitting at your desk? How important is your sketchbook in your daily creative routine as a tool to pin down ideas and get the creative juices flowing? Brad Geiger of Philadelphia, PA, I turn this question to you. How much of a sketchbook person is Brad Geiger? Uh, Probably more than you'd think, but not the way you think. In other words, I carry a sketchbook with me, and it is kind of my Bible. It keeps me tra- in track of where I am in my storyline, what I've got planned, anything that is, that is even coming up like around the house. If I've got an appointment, like a dentist appointment, I'll end up scribbling that in the corner because I know I'm going to be open to that page eventually, and and uh, and it'll remind me. Uh, and 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 of course, since I got uh, uh, my sketch wallet, I'm doing a lot more of that because it's it's, it's like right in my pocket. So if something comes to mind, I, uh, I can pull that out and, and just start uh, scribbling away. The, the difference is, I think when most people talk about sketching, they're talking about drawing. And uh, if you look in my sketchbook, you see precious little drawings necessarily. Uh, but instead, what you see is an awful lot of words. There's a lot of ideas. There's a lot of joke attempts or, or you know, like punchline uh, ideas. There's a concept written down for and maybe just a one sentence concept for that. I know that can be worked into a good uh, cartoon for Patreon. Uh, there's, there's, of course, storylines upon storyline upon storyline going through and some of them getting crossed out and reworked and all of that. If you open up my sketchbook, uh, you you, you'd find an awful lot of stuff there, but it's not what you're thinking. What, what, what about you? Uh, I am probably decidedly not a sketchbook person. Like you, though, I yeah. do have sketchbooks all around the studio, and I use them, uh, especially with Drive, as part of my writing process. So there's a lot of ideas scribbled down in sketchbooks. Um, and there's an occasional quick study. Like, actually, I did sketch out something for this week's Drive in a sketchbook, and then I took a photo of it and brought it into Photoshop. Um, so I have done that kind of stuff, uh, Mm -hmm. but I will be honest to you with you, Brad, and this is an unsatisfying answer probably because it doesn't feel like whimsy, but I don't sketch much anymore unless it has a purpose or is sellable or is (laughs) part of a larger project. And that makes me sound so Machiavellian as like, I don't have any more joy left in my heart, Brad. I only draw when there's a dollar sign. But I have enough (laughs) projects now where I don't need to draw for whimsy. I've got enough stuff to draw. It's actually waiting for me to draw, you know? Yeah, yeah. Now, I will, uh, like, a, 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 the only exception to that is every now and again, like on Saturday morning, when I get up before anybody's awake and I start the coffee brewing and I uh, go out on my front porch and enjoy the, the early morning air, uh, that during those times, I will just do, that's just kind of like found time. Uh, I, I will do it kind of like, uh, oh, what do you call that when there's a, a free association? I'll do a lot of free association drawings where I'll just start with one dumb character and then just free associate to the next and to the next. And I, I do get uh, quite a few ideas uh, for Cape Carnival, which is my Patreon uh, co- comic that's just based on licensed superheroes and stuff like that. Uh, because it's like, oh yeah, what would Mr. Fantastic look like at the produce section of the grocery store? You know, let's, let's see where that goes. Okay. That didn't go anywhere. Let's take him to the auto mechanic getting his muffler changed. Nah, that was no good. And (laughs) yeah, but I'll just do free association stuff because it, it, there's literally nothing else going on and I don't have to feel like I'm wasting time. I should be working on this commission or I should be working on the storyline. Uh, I do do that, and I do come up with some nice ideas that way every once in a while. But uh, but nah, mostly when I when I've got that sketchbook open, I'm writing. Yeah, I I realize how cold I sound compared to you, where you're at least you're at least uh, sketching for whimsy on Saturday morning. Oh, but listen, that happens like twice a month. <laughs> oh, really? Okay. <laughs> you know, it's 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 not like a regular thing. But I I. 
Uh, my so I'm coming from a very Machiavellian, very not Machiavellian. It's more utilitarian. Like for me, yeah. the drawing has to be of use to my career. Like I don't draw yeah. for just pure whimsy. And and granted, that's maybe to my detriment. Maybe I should. But uh, it's kind of like asking a surgeon, "Hey, do you ever just do surgeries on the weekend for fun? Just you ever just you ever just want to cut somebody open and move their liver around like that? Does that seem fun to you? Like for me, if I'm drawing all week, what I really want to do on the weekend is I love to read, I love to uh, yes. go for a swim. Yes. That's way more fun. Like I don't know why." Um, I feel guilty about it, but I see other artists who are are almost manic in filling up their sketchbook. But a part of me is yeah. like, yeah, but what are you going to do with that? Like, it, w- w- right. great, you're you're drawing. That's a good. That's a wonderful thing in and of itself. But um, I'm less of an art for art's sake kind of a person. Uh, so mm-hmm. that being said, I mean uh, Robert Crumb, who I don't generally like, was able to trade three of his sketchbooks for a house in France. So there you go. What do I know? <laughs> Maybe, maybe, maybe I'm going down the wrong path. I could be trading a Dave Kellett sketchbook with, for a house somewhere in Santa Barbara or something. Who knows? Yeah, or, um, or an apartment in Pomona. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you found the better iteration of that joke. I, I was on the right path, but you found it. Uh, yeah, <laughs> Pomona was the clincher. <laughs> the, also, like a one-bedroom apartment. You got to make it just yeah. as shitty as you can. Like, yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's amazing. Yeah, you know you can get a stu- you can get a studio apartment down in uh, El Paso. All right, well thanks. Um, so um, uh, what I'm getting at there though, but I I have been following lately. Uh, I believe he is a German cartoonist uh, or artist mm-hmm. rather named Jared Muralt on um, Instagram, J-A-R-E-D-M-U-R-A-L-T. And mainly because I am fascinated how documentarian he is, I'm assuming that's a he, um, with his process, that he Mm -hmm. takes photos all along the way, and you see that there are 14 sketches that add up to one page, which, to which I'm always like, wow, good for you. Because (laughs) for with me, you're getting one pre-sketch and that's it. And then I'm right to inks. Yeah. but uh, it's I, I'm also amazed at his sketchbooks because they are voluminous, they are uh, massive, they are constantly being filled up, and I always think to myself, are there, are, 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 where are you finding the free time? I don't know where where someone's doing that, and I guess it's yeah. just a different way of living an artist's life. To which I have to acknowledge, like mine is not the be all end all. There are very good ways to live an artist's life, but mine doesn't seem to involve filling up a sketchbook. Um, yeah critiques of that brad do you want to critique my life and and tell me why i should be (laughs) no well listen i uh, no no because i think everybody's gonna do their own thing and 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 for you to try okay so for let me spin that around for somebody listening to this podcast to say oh i'm doing it all wrong i'm drawing in my sketchbook instead of writing like Dave, I should be writing more. And uh, sometimes I do sketches in my, in my sketchbook for enjoyment and I should be more like Brad and, and just write down storylines. No, 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 no. Everybody, it, 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 art is, can be very, very intensely personal. And what's in your sketchbook is a reflection of you as a person. And it, it does. It doesn't have to look like mine. It doesn't have to look like Dave's. Uh, it doesn't have to look like uh, Jared's. Uh, it's got to look like yours. It's it's a reflection of what's going on inside your brain, and it's and and it, that therefore it's unique. And you shouldn't try to compare yourself to anybody else. That's that's like trying to compare the inside of your brain to somebody else. That's a really good. That's a really good summary of that, Brad. Actually, yeah. you know, and I, I will say this: I think uh, cartooning is a, is a unique melding of of writing and drawing, and also acting to some extent, right? Yeah. Oh um, yeah. So um, and directing. Uh, listen to me, and also painting and scene painting. No, uh, <laughs> what I'm getting at though, what I'm getting at though, is that I think I am uh, compared to other cartoonists we know. I think I am more of a writer first, and then an artist mm-hmm. second. Uh, and I think that there are other friends, and we don't need to name them, but are definitely artists first and writers second. Um, yeah, yeah. I think you, like me, probably are a writer first. I think that's not unfair to say yeah. that, don't you think? I think I think most people working in humor are writers first and artists second. Right. 
Like, I really enjoy a dance of language, and uh, there yeah. are other people that enjoy a dance of pen first. So for them, right. uh, to your point, uh, a sketchbook is a natural outlet and a great outlet because for you and I, this podcast even is kind of a warm-up sketch to jokes we might make because it gets the brain flowing in terms of thinking about humor, right? Like, I laugh yeah. more with you than, than I would sitting in a room by myself. Oh, what high praise that is, Brad. <laughs> <laughs> boy, boy, I'll tell you what, Brad, you're a lot better than sitting in a room by yourself. I tell you, Brad, you're better than most dentist appointments I've ever had. So just <laughs> FYI, what a great guy to hang out with. I tell you what, you or walking the aisles of Home Depot, I'll pick you anytime, Brad. Good job. <laughs> I spent an afternoon with Brad once. I watched a fly walk up a drape. <laughs> so anyway, to finish off Sebastian's question, I think it is... Uh, uh, it's perfectly valid to be filling up a sketchbook and there is nothing wrong with using it. I do, to Sebastian's point, use it to pin down ideas. I don't yeah. necessarily use it to get creative juices flowing. Although, having said that out loud, I'm now thinking about it. There have been times when I've really hit a wall of writer's block, which is usually of my yeah. own making. And sometimes mm -hmm. just letting a pen flow across a page just gets things moving. So absolutely, yeah. yeah. So Sebastian... More power to you if you are a, a constant sketcher and filling up sketchbooks. Even though Brad and I are not necessarily, I think we would both recognize the value of that. Don't you think, Brad, that's a good button on that one? I don't care what kind of mark you're making on a page. The more marks you make, the more your brain is working, and that's a good thing. Yeah, that's a that's a fair sign. Yeah. All right, well, on that note, I'm going to move us on to a question from Jeremy. And Jeremy writes, Dave and Brad, can you tell us about your first offset book printing experience? How many books you printed? Was it too little, too much? Basically, what went right and what went wrong? Thanks for a Grinch. Uh, thanks for a Grinch show. Thanks for a great show. Thanks How about for that? a Grinch show. Thanks for a Grinch show. Good job, Dr. Seuss. All right, Brad, tell me about tell me about your first experience, Brad. Uh, so you were young, you were in college, <laughs> you were experimenting. I was experimenting. Sure. I, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it was it was the '90s. It was different back then. Sure, yeah, uh, there was, was there was natural light uh, uh, and Pepsi Clear and sh uh... <laughs> and, Zima. and Zima. Oh God, don't forget the Zima. Oh my God, Zima. That's, was Zima that's probably the reason I was experimenting. It, Zima. Yes, yes, it was a it was a it, it was a sugary alcoholic drink. What was it? Uh, but, but, but I don't know. You know what? I don't know. I, I, I'm i going to guess it It was something that came after wine coolers. You remember 80s, the 1980s, Bartles and James kind of dominated the sugary alcohol market with uh, wine coolers. Uh, and then Zima came around. Uh, I'm not sure what that was, though. Oh, it's a lightly carbonated alcoholic beverage made and distributed by Coors. Oh, boy. So you know it's yeah. quality. About the alcohol level of a beer. Um, Zima means winter in a Slavic language, <laughs> but it doesn't say what it was made out of. Wow, huh. that's interesting. Well, anyway, Comic Lab solving the pressing questions that you had, such as, <laughs> what, is... what the heck is Zima? <laughs> and did Ziggy ever drink a Zima? That's my question. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> Did Ziggy? Sorry, Brad and I were on a Ziggy. Did, Brad and I were on a Ziggy run earlier today. Is what people need to know. We were, we were just reading Ziggy punchlines back and forth to each other, and we came to the stunning conclusion that every Ziggy would be better with a trombone at the end. So it'd be like, I went to the doctor, but he said no thanks. Wah, wah. You know that kind of thing. <laughs> that may be the best punchline yet. <laughs> he just walks into the doctor, and the doctor says no thanks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I gave it the office. Uh, so, uh, so I, to talk about my first offset book experience, as opposed to my first experience, uh, <laughs> actually, uh, this this could work in either way because my first experience was do it yourself. It was uh, all right. <laughs> it was, no, it was all right. It was. It was. DIY. This is a family show, Brad. <laughs> well, my first book experience was print on demand. And I've talked about that on how I really screwed that up. I didn't price it right. So then when it went into distribution, I really hurt myself. And that's in a previous episode. But after I did the first two books, print on demand, uh, and kind of did a do-it-yourself type of deal, I felt I was ready for an offset experience. I was going to send a quote to a printer. Uh, I sent a quote to a number of different printers, uh, took the best option. I was really proud of myself uh, for doing it right and uh, set the cover up correctly, learned how to incorporate the spine into the cover, all of these things that you, uh, that you learn how to do when you're doing an offset print run. And I came down to the most important question 
uh, of the entire thing, and that is how many books do you want? And I was feeling very confident. <laughs> Confidence may, may be my biggest problem in, in uh, cases <laughs> like this. Uh, I, 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 I had a decision. To, to, do I want to buy it? Do I want to get five? Oh, and we, this has another wrinkle too, because I'm an old man. I had to decide whether it was 500, a thousand. Don't say this has another wrinkle because I'm an old man. That's a weird, <laughs> that's a weird permutation of that yeah, phrase. Yeah, well, you're right. This has another uh, facet because um, we didn't have Kickstarter back then. This would have been 2007, maybe 2008. There was no Kickstarter. And so I had to front the money for these. And, and in fact, I had to, I'm, I'll put all my cards on the table. I had to get a loan from the bank to make this print run. And since oh. I was, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Why do you think I harp so much? I didn't know that. Why do you think I harp on this show so much about making smart financial decisions? <laughs> because I've made a few dumb ones. Uh, and I decided that if I was going to go through all of this trouble to take out a loan and to do an offset print run, I was going to buy the uh, go on the high end of books that I could buy because, A, it drove the unit price down even though mm-hmm. the, the final price tag was higher, uh, it drove the unit price down. And because, uh, as uh, <laughs> the way I told myself, hey, these books aren't going to spoil. They're, it's not like you're buying milk. They don't have a shelf date. You're just going to, you're going to be doing cartoons for a long, long time. Uh, you're going to put these in the basement and sell them at conventions and appearances and on your website. So you might as well buy 1500 And uh, <laughs> I'd say and it probably went perfectly. The uh, end. <laughs> I'd say about a thousand of them. <laughs> about a thousand of them uh, were still in my basement up until a very short time ago. Uh, I, it, 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 Kickstarter came around and helped a little bit because then I could package that book in with a bigger reward, and I started to get rid of them a lot better that way. Uh, but for a long, long time. Uh, it was, I, I was behind the eight ball on that. And it took me a while to pay that loan off because, uh, I, I, I the book yeah. did not sell the way I expected it to. It was not flying off the shelves. I had put it into distribution through diamond and they took a real good swing on the first cut. And then there weren't a lot of orders after that. And it just, it, it was, uh, it was a bad move all the way around, uh, yeah. and I should have gone. I should have gone smaller I, because okay. Here's the counterpart to the old: they're not going to spoil. Uh, the other way to look at that is you can always print more. You know, it's it's a pain in the keister, but you can always print more if you really get to that point. Uh, you can print more, but again, Kickstarter changed all of that. Now I can look at that and say, well, listen, if I run out of book number one or if I run out of book number two, I'll just make that an add on or I build that into my next Kickstarter. So I've got some extra money to throw towards that other book and I'll print those and I'll get them back in stock. Or you could do a special Kickstarter just for those old books. You could handle it a hundred different ways. But man, oh man, back in the day before we had Kickstarter, uh, we had to take out loans for that stuff or have the money in hand to do it. And that's when it would have been a lot smarter for me to be a little bit more conservative. But uh, no, I was, I was, you know, shoot for the moon. Oh, what the hell? Get that pr- unit price down. That'll mean you make more profit. And uh, yeah, I, I really put myself behind the eight ball for quite a while. Plus, Oof. just out of out of like sheer happenstance, in the months that followed, I got my first. Uh, I, I started working with uh, the first person that w- uh, was collaborating with me as a colorist. That was Ed Rysowski, and that first book was black and white. And 
once the comic shifted to color, nobody was quite so much interested in the black and white books. Right. So that kind of uh, sped things along too. So that was my first. Uh, so what uh, I'm hearing, off-hit. Brad, is unending series of successes <laughs> is what I'm hearing on my end. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I, I share that with you openly for a number of different reasons. Number one, because I shoot my mouth off on this show an awful lot. And it's, it's only fair that I share uh, my failures as long as, as well as I'm so eager to share my successes. But also, like I've said on this show a few times, your failures are the places where you learn the most. And boy, did I learn a lot of stuff about uh, decision making uh, when I went through that. And uh, and that's served me really well in the years and years since. So I, I, I it, it wasn't a great moment in time, but I wouldn't trade it for nothing. So uh, w- what I'm hearing then is much like your first time. It was a lot of confidence going in that was followed by a lot of embarrassment and walking away kind of feeling sad about yourself. A lot of, not really, a lot of apologies. Yeah, <laughs> not really knowing what you're doing. A lot of bad decisions were yeah. made. You, you came at the problem yeah. the wrong way. The whole thing was, yeah, okay. <laughs> Yeah, I, I I for sure thought it was gonna it was gonna be a lot bigger than it was. <laughs> all right, all right. Oh God! Well, that got me. Uh, dang it! That got me. Uh, stupid joke. What a stupid joke. All right. Anyway, so uh, I have two offset experiences to share. One is in my college yeah. days, and one took place a decade later. It took me a decade to do the second one. And I think that's worth talking about. So um, here we go. So the first one was in college. I had been doing a daily strip in college um, for three years from sophomore through to my senior year. And around Christmas break of my senior year, I said, I'm going to put together a book. And the entire idea for this came because uh, I went to a school in Indiana called Notre Dame. And there was another school called IU, uh, Indiana University down the road, And they had a cartoonist who was like a year ahead of me, and they had put out a book. And I, at like whatever it was, 2021, was like, wow, somebody in college could put out their own book. This is incredible. And frankly, Brad, I say that because you kind of need to see that a thing can be done sometimes before you think, oh, well, I, Brad Geiger, could do that thing too, you know? Sometimes you don't have the self-confidence at 20 or even at 40 to go, I'm going to do this thing that no one's ever done before. But it's really helpful (laughs) to see that someone else has done it before. Anyway, long story short, this other college kid at IU had put out his own book. And somehow it ended up on the campus of Notre Dame. And I flipped through it. I was like, hey, this is pretty good. And um, so I reverse engineered how to do it. I took it to a local print shop and I said, hey, I'm a cartoonist. I want to make this. How do I make this? And the guy said, well, if you bring me a bunch of mocked up pages, we can photograph it and make a book out of it. Because this is back, by the way, pre-digital kind of days, Brad. Right. Um, So I would have mocked it up like a newspaper page. If if anyone out there remembers how they would have done it back in the day, it would have been a lot of clippings that were literally pasted onto a page. And then they would photograph the page, make a plate out of it and print that, right? Now, what were you, I, I, this is a question that only I could ask. Uh, what were you using to affix the clippings to the page? Were you using wax or glue? I was using whatever the school newspaper had around that I could use for free. So I don't remember. Oh. It probably would have been wax, I think. That was my favorite part about the old days of uh, newspaper compositing is that they would they had these little wax melters and you would slide the paper through there. It would put wax on the back of them. You'd affix it to the larger page uh, that represented the whole newspaper. And but since it was wax, you could peel that off and repaste it and peel it off and repaste it an almost yep. infinite number of times. And it wouldn't be it wouldn't wear out because you're yeah. basically it was just wax. Much like Brad's first time, he wished he would have waxed. So that's um, anyway. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to keep going back to that joke. Uh, anyway, so I I produced all the pages, but then I got to the cover and I was like, "Well, I want to do a color cover." And the guy's like, "Well, all yeah. right, you'll need to bring us a painting or something that we can <laughs> take a photo of." Oh, and I was like, my gosh, "Wait a minute, yeah. what? No, hold on." And so I hired a friend of mine who. Um, He was the first person I ever knew who knew how to do Photoshop. He had a copy of Photoshop 1.0, which had come out like four years earlier. And um, 
It couldn't do layers. It couldn't do anything. It was just Photoshop 1.0. And we go to bring the file to the printer on, I think it was a jazz drive, an external jazz drive. (laughs) And the file was too big. We couldn't fit it on the jazz drive to bring to the guy's Macintosh at the print shop. So I had to take a bunch of elements off of my book cover so that the file would get smaller. Like, I, you know, just the data. I just had to take out chunks of the drawings, take out chunks of color. So it ended up becoming a two color cover. Um, that uh, had big chunks of the drawing missing, right? And so oh. I brought that in. They printed it up, and I did a thousand of them because I my thought wow. was at the time the the school that I was going to uh, Notre Dame has about eight thousand eighty five hundred students, right? Not gigantic, not like a Texas sized university, but a pretty good sized university, not not like a mm-hmm. community college. And I I don't know why I just did basic math in my head. I was like, well. I think one out of eight students at Notre Dame likes the book, would like a book. So sure, I'll do that. <laughs> and so really stupid logic. So I printed it yeah. up and I brought one over to the bookstore. And I, of course, was going to sell them out of my dorm room. But I went over and I was like, hi, I'm Dave Kellen. I do a school newspaper comic. I'd like to be able to sell this book out of the out of the, uh, so the library or the, you know, the, the bookstore. Store. <laughs> Man, and, your pitch was horrible. Yeah. Out of the, out of the, out of the. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's Dave Kellett's first time, if anybody's wondering. Hi, yeah, I'm Dave no Kellett. Did you like to go to prom? Um, anybody. Uh, anyway, so I bring it in, and luckily for me, the head of the bookstore uh, happened to read comics a lot. She loved comics, and oh. she read the school newspaper and loved my comic. And she's like, oh, we'd love to carry this. In fact, I'm so proud of you for doing your own book. We'll put it right up front on its own little table and so here's what happened. I did an advertisement. I paid my school newspaper to run an advertisement under my comic strip for a week and said, hey, the school, the, the book collection is out and it's over at the school, uh, 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 you know, bookstore. And the dang thing sold out in like three days. All thousand copies oh sold God. out in three days. Oh my God. And I was like, God. what do I do? What do I do? And literally the lady from the bookstore, <laughs> she's a really sweet, like 65, 70 year old woman. She goes, well, honey, what you do is you print more books. And I was like, oh yeah, okay, right. That's what I do. So I printed up another 1,500 or 2,000. And that uh, oh. that took a while longer to sell, but it did sell out. And I, print, I, did, I ended up doing a third printing. Long story short, it ended up paying for grad school because the book did so well. So now wow. fast forward, fast forward 10 years, I'm about to do my first Sheldon collection. This story is too long, by the way, now. I'm sorry about this, Brad. Um, <laughs> and I'm working at Mattel. It's like 2004, I think, or, or 2005. Well, maybe it's 2006. And I'm, I'm like, all right, I'm ready to do my first Sheldon collection. So I, once again, now I know how to do Photoshop. I lay out the interior of the book. I think actually with Brad Geiger's help, if I remember correctly. Um, I lay out I the interior. I think I might have helped out on that one. Yeah, yeah. On whatever we used before InDesign. What was it called? Uh, Quark Express? Quark, Quark Express. Yeah, so yes. that book was laid out in Quark Express. Yeah. And then uh, I designed the cover, but I did. I wasn't quite good enough. So I hired one of my friends to do the book cover for Pure Ducky Goodness. And I printed them up mm-hmm. and I was like, well, I'll tell you what, that book in Notre Dame sold really well. I'm going to buy 2,000 <laughs> copies of this. <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> and Brad, guess what? 13 years later, guess what I still have in my storage, Brad? Oh. Copies oh of God, Pure you Ducky still Goodness. Have copies of that oh book? boy, I went oh, too big and, and I went home. Um, so yeah. the long story short here is that to Brad's point, go smaller rather than larger. Like my Notre Dame yeah. experience is a happy one because I underprinted and I sold out and then I printed more, right? The the Pure Ducky Goodness, the first Sheldon book, was me being too enthusiastic for whatever that uh, maybe it was more than two thousand, because I sold I might have been. Th- I might have done three or four thousand for that first run because I still had a bunch of them, uh, and they sold. Yeah. Pr- they sold okay. Like it was enough to do the second book. Anyway, long story short, Brad, I did too dang many of them. Too dang many of them. Yeah, like to the point where if you're going to do offset printing, my gut response for most people is do five hundred to a thousand. Like that's yes. see how they do, yes. and then and then go another thousand, or then go two thousand. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump in on that for a second because you you get you've got good advice, but again, you got to remember we're living in the era of Kickstarter, and as I always say, Kickstarter is free market research, and so you should probably set your let, let let's say you're getting a quote. 
and let's say you've decided, well, maybe uh, about 500 and you do your Kickstarter and you see that this thing is going great guns. In fact, you've got 300 books that are going to go out the door for the Kickstarter itself, leaving you with only 200. Guess what that means? You better order 750 to 1000, right. right? And you're going to have the money to do it because this thing if you've set it up properly uh, and not uh, you know gotten all bogged down in in stretch goals that are are high cost items and stuff like that. If you set this Kickstarter up properly, if you this thing starts running away at a gallop, you can adjust your number of books right. and cover them up front. Uh, that's the whole reason Kickstarter is there. It's free market research. Yep. Uh, so yeah, I, I, I think Dave's right in that you start maybe conservatively at 500, 750 or something like that, and then watch your Kickstarter. How's that going? If that's going great, Make the number bigger. First of all, Brad's advice is perfect right there. I will definitely co-sign on that. Use your Kickstarter as market research. And then what I tend to do yeah. now, Brad, is if a book is underperforming on Kickstarter, what I do is I order whatever the number for Kickstarter is plus 10%. I don't know what you do, but I thought that would be a helpful yeah. thing to share. And the reason why I do t plus 10% is... Um, there's always going to be some damaged ones, some lost in shipping ones. And then, God forbid, you also want to yep. have some around for the next year or two, not forever, but just for the next year or two to sell on and make additional profit, right? So I always yep. do whatever the book run is on Kickstarter plus 10%, unless the caveat is, unless it's a drive book, because those are a series. And God, it would suck to have a bunch of Act 1, a bunch of Act 2, don't have any of Act 3, bunch of Act 4, out of Act 5, you yeah, know, that would suck. Yeah. So I always try to match my print run to whatever stock I have left with the thought is that when they all run out, I will probably have to, you know, reprint Acts 1 through 3 or Acts 2 through 5 or whatever it is at the same time. But then at least I can do them in a, in a yeah. shared shipping truck and I'm saving a little bit of money then anyway, you know. Yeah. So that's the way I do it, Brad. That's a great idea. The only thing I need to throw in there is do you do distribution through like Diamond or one of the other distributors? So that's a great question. I used to do Diamond and I was really, really underwhelmed by how archaic and slow <laughs> and non-responsive yeah. their system is. Yeah. Um, it's Diamond feels, and I, this is not necessarily shot, this is honestly how they do it. Diamond feels like a business that still works a lot on paper invoicing and faxes yeah. and like yeah. um, hand calling individual shops around the country to get their invoices paid and that kind of stuff. Like it's an old business and it does mm -hmm. not feel very efficient and it bothered me. I never liked it. So I know there are people that have worked out how to do Diamond well. Uh, you have among many people. I never did. And so I just don't, I don't enjoy doing business with them. So I never, I don't really uh, do Diamond, no. What I've yeah. started to do is I've started to use Amazon Advantage where you can list your mm -hmm. own books on Amazon. And it is a slow curve, but I'm curious to try it because A, Amazon's buying power is gigantic when you get moving. And then yeah. B, uh, I feel like it is a, it's a slow curve that will eventually go elliptical, uh, not elliptical, it'll be, um, it'll be a curve that'll, that'll rapidly shoot up at a certain point, you know, um, like I'll sell yeah. two copies this week three copies next week, eight copies the next week, you know, that kind of a thing. So I'm, I'm <laughs> yeah. early on in the process with that, but I'm slowly getting all my books listed onto Amazon. So that's, that's what I do. How about you? And then you tell me about your, your diamond experience. No, I, I agree. I still, I still hang with diamond, but, uh, but I'm putting a lot more steam and it's a topic that we really should talk about a little bit more in an upcoming show, uh, putting a lot more steam behind Amazon advantage, because what, like you said, once you've got that, uh, that's the biggest bookstore in the world. You don't have to. You don't have to worry about bookstores after that once you've got that licked. And and you're right. It's a slow learning curve, but uh, I'm sticking with it for exactly that reason. Well, and also, Brad, uh, not to be a doom and gloom person, but I see the writing on the wall for most American bookstores and for definitely right. for most American comic book shops. And yeah. Diamond is not long for this world for the simple reason that comic book shops are not long for this world. You know, I really, right. I feel like we're only a few years away from a serious, uh, as if there hasn't been one already, but a much more serious um, drop in comic book shops as they become less and less viable. Um, 
And then depending on how Barnes & Noble is able to turn around their books, quite literally their books, um, uh, I'm not sure how how long they're going to last either without a serious diminishment of their retail locations. So um, anyway, I just feel like Amazon is a smarter long-term play just because they're out hustling everybody in terms of uh, what they're able to bring to market, you know? Absolutely. I agree with that 100%. Hey, if you're listening while you work, take a minute to stand and stretch. And while you're doing that, we're going to tell you why you should join us on Patreon. When you do, you're going to get hours and hours of podcasts that we've recorded just for backers. And exclusive Patreon posts that go even deeper on Comic Lab topics. And access to our exclusive Discord server, which is a thriving community of professional cartoonists. So you can support the show you love and get tons of actionable resources for your own cartooning. And listen, if you can't swing a pledge this month, we get it. No worries. Yeah, yeah, listen, you can still support the show by rating us wherever you get your podcasts. Just leave a five-star review and a few kind words. That, along with mentions on social media, is incredibly helpful. Now, everybody, let's talk comics. Well, Brad, just a reminder, this is week five of our 10-week sponsorship by the good folks over at Wacom, W-A-C-O-M dot com. Yeah. And Brad, I got to tell you, uh, so I, as I mentioned uh, a few weeks back, have three Wacoms in the studio. I've got my old workhorse, the 21 UX. Mm -hmm. I've got the smaller Cintiq Companion that Beth works on to color drive and Sheldon and all sorts of other stuff. And then I treated myself, Brad, a few months back, (laughs) and I got myself that Wacom Pro 24, and it is like... mm, drawn on butter my friend oh, it's so good i've i've drawn on that and it really is amazing to have that much space to work on i i'm very jealous of you uh it's it's very nice brett it's very frankly <laughs> i there are times where i feel like i don't do, like a better artist should be drawing on that than i'm it's like <laughs> It's like putting me behind the wheel of a Ferrari. It's not fair to everyone who knows how to drive that I'm like, well, I'm just going to the grocery store. I don't, I'll just take my Ferrari. Uh, uh, but that thing is amazing. It's funny yeah. to see coming from my, so my 21 UX was the one that I bought, I don't know, 10 years ago, 12 years ago. Yeah. And uh, that has been great. It's been a workhorse. But the I don't know what they've done in terms of glass technology, but it's kind of a version of that Gorilla Glass stuff, which is yeah. like it's A, unscratchable, B, unbreakable, and C, feels smooth to the touch. Like yeah. glass, I feel like glass in the last decade has gotten really, really good uh, because that thing feels amazing when you touch it. Mm-hmm. No, and, and it and it draws beautifully, and it, it is absolutely a pleasure. In fact, I'm I'm trying to plan my next visit out there so I can draw on it again. Just yeah, push I, you out uh, of the well, way and 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 draw on it for the for the entire stay. No, I won't let anyone else draw on it, Brad. It's mine. <laughs> no. But anyway, so it's really it's really a delight to have uh, Wacom as our sponsor because it is uh, t- part and parcel of everything that we do here in the studio. So uh, a huge yeah. shout out to them and a thank you for back at Comic Lab this week. And Brad, let's jump back into the questions now, my friend. I've got one for you that okay. I wanted to ask you. And this, is, uh, this comes out from a friend of ours here at the show and says, Brad and Dave, how have you coped with building a sustainable comics career That is your entire source of income, but also then becoming burnt out with the workload and or the subject matter of the work itself. So, Brad, this is something we can both put our thought behind because we've kind of both had this happen at different points. Um, You pour everything into Evil Link. You love it. Oh, it's delightful, Brad. It's everything you wanted. And you've turned it into a career. Oh, my God, Brad. The thing that you love is now making you a living. Oh, Brad, five years pass and you hate it. Yeah. Yeah. What do you do? What do you do? It's. It, I wouldn't say hate, but it, it, it's some of the sparkles. I, uh, the bloom has. Oh no, has, no, I wasn't. I wasn't actually accusing you of hate. <laughs> like I just. I was saying like in this imaginary scenario. Sorry, yeah. I'll, I'll do it for me. Like I've. I've put all my lifeblood into drive. I'm almost done with the story, but now I kind of don't care anymore. Like yeah. what do I do? Well, listen. It, you've got to. You've got to listen to your body, and 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 the the the, the app. The the answer is there is no answer. I mean, I, I burnout is going to happen. You're going to have highs and lows in your creativity and in in the normal procedure of of what you're doing. Uh, what I've found works for me is a couple of things. Number one is is to pivot. Right? It, it's like okay, it, when when Evil Link Evil Link is still kind of the centerpiece of what I do. But uh, uh, other projects like Courting Disaster and Fables and later on uh, After Dark, 
uh, those were all pivots uh, from my main comic. And, and those were ways of doing something completely different, exercising some different muscles and, and, and being able to do that. And then what I found out was, you know, when I came back to Evil Inc., I, I was a little bit uh, recharged because I, ha- I was doing something a little different uh, that, that uh, uh, enabled me to do something. And, and, you know, they say a change is as good as a rest. Uh, and the other part is, honest to goodness, it, it, you know, if you need to rest, you need to rest. You need <laughs> you need to take a little break and and find maybe something else to do. Or, and I did this with Greystone uh, many many times. Uh, I, I just made Greystone whatever I wanted it to be for a little while. Like, and that's really how Evil Ink came about. Is for a little while right. I wanted to write about supervillains, so Evil Ink became about supervillains for a little while. And uh, and and so don't I, I would I would say don't get penned in by preconceived notions. If this thing is, if you're working on something and and like Dave's comic or like my comic, it's your main source of income, and and you just. You, you you don't have the luxury of being able to just stop doing it for a month or step away for a little while. Uh, th- then your next best bet is to find a way to pivot and to say, okay, what do I want to do? What is what is the thing that is bringing me joy, and how can I pivot uh, from my main co- uh, comic into that thing? I, right. Uh, but aside from that, Dave, I, this is something I struggle with because uh, I, I don't know that there are good answers to this. Uh, uh, tell me, tell tell me what your thoughts are. Well, so okay. First of all, I think you're right, Brad. I think you're very right that a pivot is a better way to go about it than a cold stop or a huge yeah. change up uh, for a bunch of reasons. But we and, and I'll go into them too. But I, I do want to bring this into this conversation first, which is that aside from Charles Schultz, who went 50 years, quite literally up to his deathbed, drawing um, peanuts, I think mm-hmm. a lot of the cartoonists that we grew up with um, either changed or stopped titles around about 10 years. Don't you think that was about the maximum that most people went? And that, by the way, that 10 year point is with all the income that they could have ever wanted to make from it, all the fame they ever could have wanted to make from it, all that sort of stuff. So Mm -hmm. on average, I think a lot of cartoonists start to feel burnout around five to seven years. It's just, they went to 10 because the money was so good and everything was working, you know, frictionless basically. So Uh, I mention that because I want you to not feel alone in this feeling of burnout or feeling of disinterest towards the titles that you're doing right now. Um, so I, like Brad, I want to I want to emphasize pivoting, and here's how I'll do it. Um, my college strip was called Four Food Groups of the Apocalypse. A terrible title, by mm. the way. Um, and <laughs> but there was one character in it called Sheldon Brad that I really enjoyed drawing, mm. like physically enjoyed drawing. It was like he had a lot of goofy shapes. He had these big glasses that I like drawing. And so I said, you know what? I'm going to take that character and I'm going to pivot into a new strip called Sheldon. Right? Do 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 do. I'm doing Sheldon for about seven years, and in the meantime, I'm making a lot of friends and uh, in comics. And I was I had finished my master's degree in comics. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to pivot all this uh, experience and professional affiliations and make a movie about comics called Strip. That's what I'll do. I'll start using all <laughs> yeah. these friendships that I have and start making a movie about comics. And then in the meantime, I, uh, I, I started to diminish the output. Sheldon was once upon a time, seven days a week output. And I said, you know what? I'm going to replace one day a week on Sheldon. I'm not even going to build a new website. I'm just going to do a Saturday sci-fi feature called Drive because I have this story that I would like to do. And I'm going to I'm going to do the sci-fi. In fact, I didn't even have a title for it. So I'm just going to draw this sci-fi thing on Saturdays and share it with Sheldon readers. And then about six months into that, I was like, okay, this seems to have some legs. I'm going to build its own website. And then I pivoted into being a two-title cartoonist. And frankly, over the years, I've kind of diminished my output on Sheldon and put more and more focus on drive. And that's okay. I think that's actually the smart way to do it is slow transitions, letting your audience Mm. ease into it, potentially finding a new audience and getting comfortable with either reducing or uh, or increasing an output based on how much you're enjoying a thing. And uh, to Brad's point, I think if, if you don't pivot away and if you don't listen to your body and to your heart, then your, your, that way lies, uh, um, frustration and um Mm -hmm. frankly dissatisfaction with your your involvement in art at all like eventually you'll just have a cold break because you'll be like i'm done and you tip over the table and walk away because you're you're really frustrated from it whereas i think if you transition if you pivot like brad and i have both suggested then 
you maintain all the joy, the uh, the um, satisfaction, the excitement about cartooning, and you just direct it towards the new thing, while maybe continuing the old thing if that's comfortable for you, or maybe slowly editing it, you know, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's the better way to do it. Because also, um, let's not mince words here. If you have, and it sounds like your question does, if you have a set income from a thing, you can't be so mm. ballsy and egotistical to be like, Bleh, who needs money? I'm, I'm post-capitalist over here. I'm going to live under a bridge yeah. and I'm fine. That's all I need. Yeah. Like, it's nice to be able to buy a, a, a head of lettuce and a loaf of bread from time to time. So <laughs> don't, don't completely walk away from that income and or, uh, yeah. you know, supplement it with outside artists if maybe that's something you'd like to do. But keep it mm. going while you build up what the next thing is with the knowledge and the awareness that it's going to take you a year or two or maybe more to start building up the income on the new title that you're transitioning to or pivoting to. Right, Brad, don't you think? Mm -hmm. I think the, I think there are two main takeaways here uh, in terms of the pivot. And, and one is, uh, cause I keep thinking about, okay, great. We're telling this person to pivot. What do you pivot to? Right. Right. Anybody can just yell pivot like uh, like Ross on Friends at the bottom of the stairs trying to get the couch up. Right. Anybody can just yell pivot. Uh, But where where do do you pivot to? That's that's where my mind is going next. And so here's here's a couple of thoughts that I'm uh, that I'm I want to bounce off of you. Number one, uh, without getting too Marie Kondo on you, I think you've got to find your joy. And, and in other words, you've got to realize that your pivot could literally be any topic. It could be any, you know, a category. What brings you joy right now? What's the thing that, that makes you yes. giddy thinking yeah. about or the yep. thing that you think, oh, if I had the opportunity, I would do this, knowing full well that you could, like, doing what Dave said, you know, keeping the other thing going, you could start to find ways to give yourself that opportunity. Doesn't mean that you're going to start publishing it today. You could just start writing about it. And and I think you might find that just the act of writing it, okay, let's, let's, let's take this uh, and put it into an example. Uh, let's say you want to do a fantasy about dragons and knights. I do. No, okay, keep going. <laughs> I'm listening. <laughs> um, let's let's say and let's say in, in, that that you want to make it a uh, fantasy, and you don't want to do humor. You want to do like an actual story, and you want it there to be an arc, and you're gonna you're gonna build in this uh, this eight step progression and all of this stuff. Just the act of starting to work on that could start to be something that that recharges your battery cuz you're you're giving yourself the ability to start working on something else you're start you you you're you're seeing maybe a a chance to build something uh but wherever your joy is just start working on it just start giving yourself uh, the permission to spend a couple hours uh on it maybe a, a couple hours a day maybe it's only a couple hours a week at the beginning uh, but but give yourself the opportunity and the permission to start. And the other thing I want to throw out there is this. Uh, we're all at comics people. We're all in comics because we like doing comics. We love the the form and and we've found an aptitude of drawing and writing. But I'm gonna I'm gonna put it out there that maybe your pivot isn't necessarily a comic. Maybe you take what you learned in comics, to the pivot, to the next thing. Very similarly to what Dave did with Stripped, where, uh, 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 of course, you know, Stripped was uh, based on the concept and the and the topic of cartooning. But what if Dave had done uh, uh, a movie about sailing, sailing boats, all right? He could have taken what he learned in several years of doing independent comics to that movie project. And I, I have every indication that if Dave wanted to do uh, a documentary about sailing, it would be a really great documentary. It would be a documentary I'd want to watch. Thank you, Brad. So <laughs> that's right. So uh, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is, A, try to find your joy. Find that thing that sparks even a little bit of joy uh, that you can kindle into a flame. And number two, don't limit yourself to thinking that it's got to be a comic. Yeah. Maybe it's, maybe it's going to be something completely different or maybe just a little bit different. Maybe it's a limited animation thing. Maybe it's God knows, maybe it's a greeting card. I don't know, 
Maybe it's something different. Right. Maybe maybe it's uh, something small and personal that won't be shared public that helps you rekindle the love for comics in general. Yeah. So like sometimes uh, your brain just needs the ability or the, the, the chance to let itself rest or direct to something else. And then you'll find a rekindled love of comics. That's also happened for me. Yeah. But I want to put a pin in Brad's idea and take uh, another step or a different stab at this because mm-hmm. so Brad said, find the thing that's sparking joy in a, in a Marie Kondo kind kind of way. And I think there's a lot of wisdom mm-hmm. to that. I think Brad's right. I think find the topic, the subject matter, the genre, the style, the look that makes you go, oh, and and focus on that for a little while, right? That's a, that's a definite possibility. But I also want to speak to something else because I suspect that this question asker, oh, this question asker <laughs> is, is in a place similar to where I was around year eight or nine on Sheldon, which is, mm-hmm. you know, you're frustrated. You know you're tired of the topic and the comic strip that you've been doing, right? This is where I was with Sheldon. Mm -hmm. But you don't yet know what your spark is for the next thing. And that's a frustrating place to be in, right? Because you feel like you're treading water on the current title, and I'm sure there was a moment in Greystone Inn where you felt like that was the case, Brad. Um, Oh, yes, very much so. And I definitely felt that with Sheldon, where I'm like, I got to keep keep producing. I don't feel a lot of ideas coming. Don't feel a lot of joy with this. Ah, Boy, got to keep going, though. (laughs) But part of it is the recognition and the allowance for yourself. So A, be kind to yourself in that moment because it happens to all of us. And B, um, allow this possibility to enter your mind. When you're feeling frustrated, when you're feeling stilted and stunted and like you know you're ready for the next thing, but it hasn't sparked yet, usually that's a moment waiting to happen. And I don't want to sound too wishy-washy and like, dreams are rainbows that live within us or whatever, you know. Right, but right, right. usually when you're feeling that sense of frustration, you have reached a plateau with that idea, that concept, whatever, and you're ready to move to the next one. And sometimes you mm-hmm. just have to allow yourself that it takes time to find what the next one is. And that's okay too. Yeah. So to, building along with Brad's point is try to find the thing that's sparking joy. Sometimes you don't know what the next thing is yet, but the frustration, the the feeling of being stilted or stunted or stuck in a spot sometimes helps encourage you to get to the next thing that's going to spark joy. You know what I mean, Brad? Like the Mm -hmm. process of feeling frustrated actually is helpful in that moment. And you can recognize it as being helpful because it helps get to you. It helps get your brain moving about like, what's new? What's different? What's next? What can I do next? And I'd also say this because Brad, I actually wanted to talk to you about this from last week. I think it was last week's episode. Mm. We talked about how to find a new story, sometimes you just have to break down a classic to basic elements to see why does Romeo and Juliet work? Why does Jason and the Argonauts work, right? right? We talked about that. So I want you Mm -hmm. to know what happened after that conversation, Brad, because I think you'll find this interesting, and it might even help our questioner in in this regard, is that... I, for whatever reason, started breaking down to basic elements, League of Gentlemen, the the story that mm-hmm. Alan Moore wrote, you know? The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, yes. Yeah, sorry. Oh, did I, <laughs> I said it wrong. Ah, okay, I'm a dummy. Um, no, I started breaking down League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. Like, why does this work? What are the basic building blocks of mm-hmm. the story? Why does it click together? Why? Did, why how, did it, how, how did Alan make this work at all? And in breaking it down, I immediately got an idea for a new story that I wanted to do, Brad. And so for the past week, Beth and I have been brainstorming about like what angles could I take on this? How long is the story? How do I do it? How do I execute it when I'm already busy with driving Sheldon? How do I do all that? Uh, But I got to tell you, I totally by accident, just by breaking down (laughs) League of Extraordinary Gentlemen and into its most basic building blocks of story, I was like, oh, I know how I could build this up into a totally different story using these basic building blocks of a story. And so- Yeah. I might advise that to our question asker too. Is just God damn it! I said question asker. Our questioner um, <laughs> about uh, you broke yourself of it in the in the previous iteration, and you went right back. It's like the dark side pulling you ever closer. Right. So what uh, exactly? What I what I would suggest is like find the stories. Even if you yourself are not sparking on joy for something that you're creating, find the stories mm. that are to you right now sparking joy, sparking excitement, sparking pleasure. Right. So even if it's uh, yeah. even if it's something like house hunters international what is it about house hunters international (laughs) like break it down to its most basic thing it's people at moment facing a moment of crisis and choice they're given three choices and they've got to work through it right well that you you brad and i give us 20 minutes we could come up with a story for why house hunters international is a compelling uh story building block right um but it could be anything break down why steven universe works break down why simpsons works breaks down why game of thrones works for you get it down to its most basic building blocks and then build it back up with the things that spark joy about it for you 
Uh, Brad, thoughts about that? Oh, that's a really, I like that idea a lot. I just, just in, in the fact that uh, you can take something because, okay, like uh, we say, oh, Find uh, find your joy. Find the new thing. Right. It's like well, thanks. I don't I don't know what my new thing is. I don't know if I if I had my joy, I wouldn't be writing you, exactly. dummy. Exactly. Uh, so <laughs> so, but what you can tell is what do I like on Netflix or what do you like reading right now? That you can tell. I mean that you that you know. What am I enjoying that isn't mine? And then take that thing and distill it, like Dave is saying, and boil it down and say, okay, there are, there are some there are some common themes here. There's uh, you know a, a romance, and there's fantasy, and there's this uh, mechanic where they can't be together but they want to be together. And then build that, like Dave just got done saying, right back up into the thing you want to do, and you, you might find your next thing that way. I, I think that's a really good strategy. Yeah, and uh, so if, as I suspect, based on how you worded this question, if you are feeling stuck in this moment and probably uh, depressed and feeling as though no forward progress can be made. And maybe that even includes that you're not really enjoying art that you're consuming. You can also give Mm -hmm. yourself time and say it's okay to take uh, a a, a pass, keep doing the work that you want to do or that you have to do because that's bringing in the income. But give yourself the pass that maybe you're not producing your best work right now. Maybe you're not enjoying it as much as you used to. That's okay too. Like be kind to yourself because it's not always going to be firing on all pistons and and be sunshine and rainbows. Sometimes all of us have to work through uh, and be creative and funny and entertaining when there's a death in the family or when someone has broken yeah. their leg or you actively have the flu and you still have to create a, a, a comic. Um, so just be kind to yourself that the work that's being produced right now might not be your best, but you're doing your best and that's okay too, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I think that's the best thing we could tell somebody in this situation is that you know, it, it just be nice to yourself. <laughs> you know? And that's kind of that's kind of a universal for all of us is it's OK as yeah. your default to just say, I'm just going to be kind to myself. I'm doing the best I can. Yeah. And if nothing else, know this, that we love you. We think you're awesome. And and uh, and, <laughs> and and we've been where you are and uh, you're going to get to the other side. Uh, it, exactly. it's, it's just going to take a little bit. Yeah. Can I tell you, I thought you were directing that towards me for a second. I was like, oh, I love you too, Brad. Thanks, man. Uh, I appreciate listen, it. <laughs> it doesn't always have to be it, about you. It wasn't about me. You were directing it outward. And I was like, oh, I guess no. all right. I'll wait another decade for him to express his love for me. All right. Uh, I guess this brings out the softy in me because uh, this is something that we all deal with and it's so intensely personal and and so very uh, upsetting and raw. Yeah. Yeah. That that it's like you you don't th- you in that moment, each one of us thinks that we're the only person that this has ever happened to. And what's wrong with me that I, I here I am. I got this comic. It's what I've wanted since I was 12 years old. And <laughs> now I'm such a you know, I, I can't I, I can't be happy with it. There must be something wrong with you. No, no. I got news for you. We've all been there. <laughs> We've all grappled with it, and it stinks. Yeah, and also, by the way, to to build on Brad's excellent point there, think of any hero you have. Guess what? I bet you 10 bucks that Bill Watterson felt like shit when he ended Calvin and Hobbes. I bet you every time DC reaches out to Alan Moore to talk about some Watchmen follow-up, he's like, he doesn't want to do it, but he he probably feels (laughs) shitty about it. Uh, I guarantee you that Burke Brethren felt shitty when he ended Bloom County. Anytime any one of us has to end something, in a way, it's it's a bit like a child, and it hurts to have to end it, and you feel insecure Mm -hmm. about it, and you a little bit are self-hating about it, a lot a little bit self-hating about it. And so uh, you are not the only one for whom... I mean, Arthur Conan Doyle freaking killed uh, Sherlock Holmes. Killed him. (laughs) Threw him over a cliff. And then had to sheepishly go, "Uh, I guess I'll bring him back. Uh, I guess he said, oh, look, everybody. Little hand-waving. He's okay. Look, he grabbed onto a tree he was was only mostly dead he was only mostly dead and he hit the water so he's okay haha remember that part where i accidentally killed him oh it's okay he's alive again i sure like buying food okay um so what i'm getting at is you're not alone this is turning into a longer answer than than we probably uh need to go on but the answer is you're not alone in this moment all artists feel this this problem of sustainability of an idea and uh, not every idea can go forever, and that is okay. In fact, most ideas have a time limit on it and a lifespan on it, and yeah. that is okay. So we've got to be kinder to ourselves in those moments of transition when an old idea is saying goodbye, and we've got to make room to welcome a new idea coming in. 
Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and uh, one thing, keep us posted. Let us know how it's going. You've got, uh, there'll be more months, more shows. Uh, I'd, I'd love to hear a follow-up on this one. This is one I'm, I'm interested in, in hearing a follow-up. Yeah, and speaking of a follow-up, uh, here's a good one, Brad. This comes yeah. in from Jeff uh, over at patreon.com slash comic lab. And Jeff says, Brad and Dave, are there any things you would like to avoid as you move forward in your careers? Are there any trends or concerns that you feel it necessary to plan around? Thank you for sharing your joy of comics. So, Brad, this oh. leads directly from that uh, question, which is very much an internal to one that's uh, more broadly focused for all of us. Yeah. Uh, what? But I guess in this case, what do we specifically want to avoid? What? <laughs> what? Uh, what things, Brad, are you worried about, and you would like to uh, avoid as you move forward in your career? What are the trends or concerns you feel necessary to plan around? I know exact. Well, I know what trend I want to avoid personally, and and uh, and it's this: when we were. First, doing web comics in the early 2000s, and we were doing this unknown thing of putting comics on the web. Uh, the syndicated cartoonists looked at that and they were very angry. They were convinced that we were killing them, we were killing newspapers, uh, we were giving it away for free, which was never accurate. We were we were running a, an ad supported business model, but it, it, for for all the uh, exterior, it looked like we were giving it away for free. And, and we were very, uh, we are very much outcast for that. And, uh, instead of, uh, being, uh, being able to look up to mentors in cartooning, we ended up, uh, uh, having an adversarial relationship. And at the same time, we were saying to them, listen, this is very simple. You can see the writing on the wall. You can see what the internet is going to do to print publishing. Uh, this is, this is not going to stop. You can't put the genie back in the bottle and, right. you know, come along along with us. This is going to be, this has some, some real upsides and they could not see it. They, they, they were convinced that it's just, I, I, here's the deal. And, and you guys are wrong. You guys are bad. And that's all there is to it. And when you would, you'd actually have a face-to-face -face conversation with some of these folks and say, okay, here's what you got to do. You set up a, a WordPress site and immediately their eyes would blur over and they'd say, nah, that's it. I'm out. I'm not doing any of that. I don't understand it. I don't get it. I don't want it. I'll just go back to the newsroom and hope for the best. That's what I want to avoid. And, and I'm yeah, telling you, we yep. say that in a snarky way. I don't want to become those old, uh, that old guard. And, and, and <laughs> well, listen, we said that on Web Comics Weekly, right? Uh, in 2005, we said, I don't want to turn into those guys. And it was kind of like, uh, I don't want to grow feathers and fly around the room. It was something that was, couldn't have possibly happened. Uh, 10 years later, when we say, I don't want to turn into that, it's, we say it with a lot less chortling and chuckling because already <laughs> <laughs> we see in so many different ways that it not, not only have we turned into that a little bit on, on topic A or topic B, but how easy it is to fall into that. Right. I, 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 right. I, for me, you know, it was like Instagram. <laughs> what? Yeah. I got to do Instagram now. And, and it's, it's so foreign to me and I don't, I don't know. You can't share or you, I, I don't want it. I don't, you guys are wrong. I'll just go back to my website and hope for the best. You know, uh, it's yeah. real easy to turn into that. And, and, and in certain ways, inevitably, we we have blind spots and we have places where we just have a hard time understanding because it's so different. Uh, but it's my biggest fear. And it's the thing that I'm always trying to be on guard about is is th th there's new stuff coming. I've got to continually uh, keep up to date with it. I've got to keep an open mind and I've got to be willing to learn new things, learn new skills and, and learn new approaches uh, because it, it's it, it, already we've seen such a huge drastic shift in web publishing over the last 20 years. And there's nothing to say that it's not going to get even more complicated and crazy yep. in the next 20. So that's the thing I want to personally avoid is turning into one of those old guard people who can't see their nose in front of their face. What about you, Dave? What are you worried about? Boy, 
Well, I, I got to tell you, I'm, I want to echo Brad exactly. Yeah. Uh, it's funny that you and I came up at the same time because I'm like, yep, 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 yeah. everything you were just saying. <laughs> uh, so uh, uh, not that I particularly like him, but he had a good quote. Jack Welch, the old CEO of GE, had some kind mm-hmm. of a quote that said, like, if you're not constantly scared, you're in trouble. Um, yeah. And th- that's a little extreme. But his point in business was that you have to, to Brad's point, you have to be constantly moving and learning new skills and trying out the new. And because it's not unlike that old thing about a shark, that if a shark sits still, it dies. It's got to keep moving forward, right? Mm-hmm. And a lot of the people that we were trying to bring forward from newspapers were like, no, I'm staying still. I don't want to learn that other stuff. And also, <laughs> I'm, current, I'm currently making $300,000 in my newspaper career. Why would I want to make right. an extra $3,000 doing web comics? And we were trying to say, because if you don't transition at it, <laughs> out of that, that $300,000 is going to go away, and you're going to have nothing at the end of that. You know, and, yeah. and sure enough, that's now, unfortunately, happened to a lot of them. But um, so to Brad's point, one of the things like with Instagram, have I figured out a way to make a ton of money with Instagram yet? No, I probably total grand total made a thousand bucks off of Instagram, but I put, I'm trying to keep a toe in that water because I don't want to be caught flat footed when the internet changes. And Mm -hmm. to to the discussion we had earlier on the show about Amazon advantage, uh, am I making a ton of money on Amazon advantage? No, but I see the writing on the wall as far as future book distribution. So I'm trying to get a toehold now and learn it slowly so that the pain is not so sudden if all of a sudden the internet rules change and and it becomes exceedingly expensive for me to ship my books for example with postal service rates and so people have to buy it through amazon prime because it has the free shipping on it right Mm -hmm. so what i'm saying is to to brad's point there are specific things that i'm not currently making money on that i'm trying to learn and grow with so that if things change i'm not caught flat-footed um yeah that's a big one Um, Another trend that I have a big fear of is, uh, as I alluded to a second ago, is the the idea that the Internet will start costing more and more. Mm -hmm. When uh, when the uh, when Ajit Pai changed the rules a year or two ago, Brad, nothing dramatic has happened yet, but it opened the door for dramatic things to slowly start happening. Mm -hmm. As I said before, like a like a like a lobster in a slowly boiling pot, that Internet fees will get tacked on here and there and over here and over there as ISPs and and uh, and uh, your local uh, Internet providers start to um, raise the fees on everything and things will just get more expensive for us to host our own comics. So uh, I also want to keep an eye on that as things go forward. And then in general, the big trend that I want to avoid is that Brad refusing to express love for me, even though I've asked him, I've asked him specific. I tried to teach him that Brad, unlike your comics, Eros is not the only type of love. There is also philia. There is agape. There's different Greek words for different kinds of love, Brad. You don't just have to. It's it's not just relationships, Brad. You can, it's you okay for you to fi- say. It- if you want the Philios and the Acope, you got to get a little bit of Eros. That's how there is to it. <laughs> I want to make it creepy. <laughs> uh, anyway. Here's here's one other thing I want to throw into the mix. But what, what you said, that's ap- absolutely right in terms of the overall internet. Here's the other thing that we have to really keep a sharp eye on. And that is, j- and it's been, it's been happening right in front of our eyes in which the web has become more and more centralized towards uh, social media, Facebook, yeah. Twitter, Instagram, and stuff like that. And uh, it, it's a trend that that I'm definitely keeping my eye on in that social media maybe started out as uh, promotion, and now it's publishing, right? We, we don't use right. social media. When social media first came out, it was like we used it to promote. We said, hey, go take a look at that stuff on my website. And people did. Now it's it, it, it's changed. And if you're not able to keep up with that change, you're getting left behind because now uh, it, you certainly do use social media to a certain extent to promote. But now it's much, much more important that you publish on social media. And that's yeah. a big trend. That's been a big, big change. And uh, as far as like looking into the future, uh, the the important thing is to see this, the what, whether Facebook and Twitter particularly are going to start to crumble under their own weight, or are they going to morph into something different, or is there going to be something that comes up that uh, either replaces it or competes with it? Uh, because now 
it, it, I, I'm always going to have that website. That's always my hub. That's always my anchor. But publishing is out on social media, and I've got to keep a real close eye on what's going on there. Right. What do you think? No, I think that's smart. And uh, I want to add to that because there's two other trends that I, um, I, I, I think I failed to mention before. One is mm-hmm. that the, the material items that you sell around your comics – will change and have changed. And I want to stay on top of that because I know people that went big in their career on the t-shirt craze in the early yeah. chunk of the 2000s, right? And that was fine because, as is true often in life, your readership is, by and large, roughly your age. Not always, but by and large, is roughly your age. And so when we mm-hmm. were in our 20s, it was fine to be selling T-shirts as a huge chunk of our business because our readership was by and large in their 20s or, or you know, high teens or low 30s, that kind of thing. But as Brad and I became older and older cartoonists, our readership aged with us. And also, the kind of ironic, cynical T-shirt phase a little bit dwindled out, right? And so we had to switch over to books and that sort of stuff. Well, now the next phase is I want to make sure that since books have become a big chunk of my living, both uh, on my store and in Kickstarter, I have to keep my eye on postal rates because I've already lost a big chunk of my oh, international yeah. audience because uh, a lovely reader of mine in Sydney who used to buy all of my books, she can't buy my books anymore because it costs more to ship the dang thing than it costs for the book, right? And so in part, that's why I'm going to Amazon Advantage and that kind of stuff. But also it makes me think, all right, I have to, for that kind of reader, I have to transition to a different kind of shippable product or get them over to Patreon, right? And so Mm -hmm. that's a big uh, part of my thinking uh, a lot in the last couple of years is that uh, books are transitioning out of my um, main stable and I have to transition more and more towards Patreon because uh, postal rates and the cost of production are are changing. So these are the kind of like transitional shifts that you have to keep your eye on. Um, Brad, anything else that I'm missing that we haven't covered already? No, I I, I I think we've covered a lot. I, and it, the more we cover, the more nervous we get. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> so maybe we put, bring that one to a close before I break out into a cold sweat. Well, let me, let me throw Brad for a loop, and we're going to do this one backwards then this week. And I'm going to say you've been listening to Comic Lab, the show about making comics and making a living from comics. Your hosts have been Dave Kellett, my friend, co-director of Stripped and cartoonist of Sheldon at SheldonComics.com and Drive at DriveComic.com. And my delightful friend Brad Geiger, the editor of WebComics.com and cartoonist of Evil Inc. at Evil-Comic.com. The Comic Lab theme song is used with permission from Andy Creighton at theworldrecord.net. This episode and all episodes were ep- edited by Matt Woodard of Woodsong Productions at www.woodsong.media. And this show, along with the uh, previous four and the next five, did I get those numbers right? You did indeed, my friend. <laughs> have been sponsored by Wacom, and you can check out all of their fine products at wacom.com. That's W A C O M.com. And Comic Lab is made possible by your support at patreon.com slash comic lab. So we'll go ahead and say that twice patreon.com slash comic lab. that real good we ought to do that in that order more often i gotta tell you my my favorite part of that was you going like a fumfering on the script like oh, the comic lab theme song was used uh, oh i've never done this before keep it together bradley keep it like your interior monologue is like you can do this brad you can do this just instant oh flop God. sweat <laughs> one, one more thing to make me break into a cold sweat <laughs>